VLAN implementation, preparing switch configurations. By the time we're done here, we will prepare a copy and paste switch configuration for implementation. Now, for those of you that have seen some of my certification series before, you might go, well, this isn't the Jeremy I know. The Jeremy I know just jacks into the console port and goes at it and blows stuff up and figures it out as we go. And, and yeah, that is the Jeremy that I am in a certification series when I'm in a lab environment and it's not two in the morning. If I'm actually doing this, I prefer to be a lot more methodical in what I do. And here's why. First off, this is the alternative to just showing up during the outage window. This is what I've done a lot, and so have a lot of other network engineers. You prepare your, your steps, you go, okay, okay, I know what I'm gonna do, and you just get there and kind of figure out the configuration as you go. And, and the great thing, and the bad thing, is it works. It may not work as well as you hoped, you might be there a lot longer than you hoped, but at the same time, it works. And that was okay for me until I had a lot of kids. And once I had a lot of kids and realized that, you know what, six in the morning, all these kids are banging on my door and there's no stopping them. I started thinking to myself, there's got to be a way to start minimizing the after hour work windows for implementation. Thus translating to spending a little more of my work day when I'm supposed to be awake, figuring out how to make my work night much shorter. And probably one of the biggest ways to make that work window shorter at night is to do this and consider your implementation flow. I can't tell you how often it's happened to me where I roll out a VLAN implementation and halfway through I lose access to a switch somewhere in the middle because I'm like, oh, management IP address, different VLAN. Duh! And I sit there trying to figure out how to regain access and I finally just end up going, ah, let's just reboot it and I lose all my configuration. I have to do it all over again. Those kind of things can cost so much time. It's only when you're going through your configuration that you start to go, oh, oh, wait, if I change GI4 to VLAN 20, then I'm going to lose access. I need, to, I need to have a different port or a different way of doing this configuration. One of the things that really got me as well is when I started realizing that documentation is a good thing, I found I would end up having to create a change log afterwards anyway so I could communicate with all the other engineers of what was done. Well, if I do a pre-config, my change log is already done. I can email out all the proposed configurations I'm planning to do then after the deployment, I just say, oh, I had to change one thing when I was there. Not document everything. The last one, and probably the biggest advantage in my mind, is it makes you not feel dumb. And it, this doesn't mean what I, I think you might think it means. What this means is there is a weird thing, I would say enigma or something, when you actually get on site and you're sitting there in an MDF or a data center with all the worrying equipment around you, blinking lights everywhere, your brain just kind of doesn't work like it normally should. Dots you could normally connect when you're sitting in an office by yourself, drawing on a piece of paper how everything should flow, just don't work when you're there in person. And if you've been there, you probably know what I mean. You often reach a point in your configuration where you're just kind of staring at the equipment and you're like, why am I so lost? I know this stuff. It's just there's too many things going on in your head at the same time. So I prefer not to feel dumb. So here's how you do it. The first thing is to take all the existing switch configurations and put them in Notepad++ or whatever your favorite editor is. And that's exactly what I've done right here. Take a look at each one of the tabs and what I name them. Suite 110, Switch 1, Original. 110, Switch 2, Original, and so on and so forth down to Suite 113, right? This is my quote unquote before configuration. And I'm not gonna leave it like that and start making my modifications. I'm gonna save those originals so I at least have something to go back to should everything go haywire. So after I have the original file saved, I'm gonna to go to File, Save As, and change this original to Commands. Now you notice I didn't name it Modified. That's because when I think of a modified configuration, I think of it's a full configuration with all the modifications in there. That's not what this is gonna be. I'll show you that in a second. So let me save the rest of these. There we go. So we put all the configurations in Notepad++. We saved them under the original file name and then created a copy of that called commands. And then we need to work through the changes we need to make. And this is kind of fun, in my opinion, a little tedious, but the beauty is you go through and you literally delete everything you don't want to modify. Because remember, this is just the list of commands, not the full config. We don't want to paste a duplicated configuration in the switch. And actually, I want to give you a sidebar for a moment because there is another strategy on doing this. 
Some people will modify the original configuration and have the complete configuration, including both the changed and unchanged items, that they'll end up replacing on the switch by copying that configuration into the startup config. Meaning, when you look at a Cisco switch, and not all switches are this way, but Cisco has it, and I like the fact that it actually has a running config and a startup config. Anything that you put in the running config, and that is things that you type in and modify the configuration as you go, are merged with whatever's there. So for example, if I add in VLAN, let's just say 4000, by typing in the command VLAN 4000 from global configuration mode, it merges that with the existing VLANs that are there. Whereas if I prepared a configuration, and let's just say deleted all this stuff and just put VLAN 4000 and copied it into the startup config, it replaces the configuration that's there. So the strategy is to make the perfect configuration with all the changes that you want, save it, and then copy that in to the startup configuration of the switch. Then your outage window is as good as rebooting that switch, it's on the new configuration, and you go home. My problem with that is I'm not that good. Meaning somewhere in there, I usually make a mistake just because I'm not perfect. And so I'll copy it into the startup configuration, reboot, and the switch never comes back up. I've lost access to it. Then I'm in a world of hurt because I'm not too sure what's going on. The place that this really works well is if you can prepare a full lab configuration, meaning you create a mirrored environment to your production, roll out all the configurations there and create it perfect. Well, that's not always an option when you have an organization that has four or 40 or 400 switches at their campus. So instead, I prefer the method where I put in the commands, that's why I called this commands, that I want to issue to each switch to change the configuration, then I paste them in one section at a time. Then if I lose access to the switch or something goes haywire, I know exactly which section caused it, and I can find my mistake pretty easily. So I'm going to do that to these four switch configurations, and I'm guessing this is going to take me about an hour to go through and determine all the configurations that I want to modify in my outage window. I'll bring it back once I'm done. And done. As you can see, each one of these tabs have been saved from the original to the actual commands, and I've gone through and actually updated all these to be exactly the commands that we need for the switches. Now, before I go through those commands with you, I want to give you a realistic view of a life of a network engineer, because sometimes watching these videos, people walk out with almost a jaded perspective of, it just happens for Jeremy. When I get to the real world, it doesn't go that smoothly for me. So I was talking to you, oh, say 30 seconds ago, at about 6.30 in the morning. That's when I was saving all of these to, from the original to the commands. And I started working on those commands, but at 7 o'clock a.m., something came up. It wasn't fun. It was an internet connection for one of our sites going down, and that took until about 9 o'clock to resolve. From there, the normal day began, complete with meetings and other work stuff. So yes, we moved from something to stuff. That stuff went till about 4.30 p.m., at which point I left to take my kids to baseball. We'll call that outside life. And that went until about 8.30 p.m., at which point I brought two of my kids back with me to the office. They're actually sitting over in the other room watching a Disney movie on the conference room projector. They're having a great time. And I am talking to you now at 10 p.m. So in reality, it took me about two hours to get all of these configurations prepared. Now some might say, well, couldn't you have done that from home? Perhaps. But for me personally, I know if I'm home, there's other stuff that will inevitably come up. And this hour and a half will actually turn into four hours and it won't be as focused or as accurate as I was able to do when I'm in a distraction-free environment like I am right now. I say all that just to give you the reality that sometimes this doesn't all work out as planned. So with that being said, let's walk through this configuration because it gives a segue to the next video, which is going to be preparing for this outage. Here's what I mean. Notice I kept the host name right at the top of the configuration, just so we can see what switch we're on. The first command that I'm issuing is the creation of all the VLANs that I need, the 10, 20, 40, 50 through 51, and 777, and the elimination of all the VLANs I no longer need. That's great but that will take down the network because all the ports are assigned to these VLANs. So already, just in preparing this configuration, I'm thinking, okay, how do I do this and not lose access to the switch that I'm configuring? More thoughts on that in the next nugget. I eliminated an old username that was no longer used that I found in this configuration. 
updated the SNMP server configurations to accurately reflect where the switch is now, and then I went through piece by piece, port by port, cleaning up and adjusting the configuration. Notice on Gigabit Ethernet 1, at some point somebody threw some port security on there, and it was inconsistent. I'm assuming somebody was testing it because no other switch had port security applied. That limits this to a maximum of two MAC addresses. Port security is good, but we should roll it out intentionally. So I'm removing that command, and then from there you can see the common command that you're going to see on all the switches. I'm adding VLAN 20 as an allowed VLAN to the trunk, and remember 20 is the voice over IP, and setting the native VLAN to 40. Couple thoughts on that. These are Cisco SG300 switches. They use an iOS-like configuration, but it's not the full command set. Ideally, I would love to have the command switch port trunk allowed VLAN 20, which replaces all of the VLANs that are on that port with just the VLAN 20 as allowed. This switch doesn't support that command. So likely when I'm said and done, I'm gonna have to go back through and remove all the VLANs from the ports that I don't need. I could have done that in this phase of the configuration, but it doesn't hurt to have the extra VLANs there, at least not initially. So I held off on removing the unused VLANs until the first configuration is in place. The native VLAN is going to be 40. That's the managed device VLAN. Based on the switch model and manufacturer that you're using, these commands can work differently. If I went into full auto mode, which in the SG300 world is known as macro mode, you can actually set this up to where it auto detects if a phone is plugged in using CDP or LLDP and then assigns the voice VLAN appropriately. I have had so many issues using macros or auto detect mechanisms. I've finally decided I'm not using macros at all. They blow up too many switch configurations. I'm just gonna go through and manually set exactly what VLANs I want on that port. Some switches allow you to do an access and a voice VLAN. Some switches support a tagged and an untagged VLAN. This is how I'm doing it on our series of switch. I'm saying it's a trunk port, so multiple VLANs are allowed, but I'm setting the untagged VLAN, also known as the native, on ports connecting to end devices as 40. That's the managed VLAN. I'm also allowing a tagged VLAN of 20. That's the voice over IP VLAN. And you notice right after that, I go to an interface range of 2 through 13. That's just because this had a unique command I just wanted to apply to that one port. Then I go for a bunch of ports in a row and do that same base configuration. Then I found some more inconsistent configuration. This one had triple E disabled, so I'm re-enabling it there. This one had LLDP disabled, so I'm re-enabling it right there. Again, my whole goal is just to make the switch configuration consistent. This is part of the cleanup. This port right here was probably used for a wireless access point at some point in the configuration because it had extra VLANs attached. So I'm removing those and adding the standard. So you can see the whole way down, I go to an interface range. I specifically focus on individual ports, just adding, removing configuration the whole way down. And I did that for every single one of the switch ports on every switch. That's why it took me two hours. It takes time to look at each port and back out all the configuration. I'm scrolling down, down, down right here. You can see that I'm also updating all the key port descriptions. My format for port descriptions is I put the port number followed by an all capital with no spaces description of the port. In this case, this connects to our internal router interface, which is an ER Pro, Ethernet free 3 on the other side. The reason I use a description like this is because it works awesome for SNMP. That's when you have a monitoring server out here that's looking at that port and adding it to its configuration. It automatically puts the port description in for that interface and then starts reporting the bandwidth on it. This allows me to see exactly what port number it is and what it's connected to on the other side without any manual configuration by me on the monitoring system. You can also see that I'm adding all the right VLAN tags for the new VLANs that this router will be routing for. This is, by the way, technically known as a router on a stick configuration. And I'm setting the proper native VLAN, the untagged that goes nowhere, 777. You can see down here I've got a wireless access point where I'm tagging all the right VLANs to allow me to add wireless access to any one of those tagged VLANs that I need. Now at the end of the day, I may decide, you know what, I don't have any wireless IP phone, so I might remove VLAN 20. I don't need those flex VLANs on the wireless access point, so I might remove them from the tags. I'm just starting off this way. Now you also notice I have native VLAN 10 right there. That puts it in the server slash static VLAN. That's because the wireless access points we're using, which is actually Unify here, only support an untagged management VLAN. 
So I'm adding that management for that wireless access point right into the VLAN it belongs in, rather than using a dead-end native VLAN. As you look down the list, there's more configuration that's exactly like the others. There's my lag port between the two switches, switch one and switch two, so you can see the description, 49 and 50 via suite 110, switch two, notice I'm on switch one right now, so that tells me where this is going, port 49 and 50 on the other side, this is considered lag one. You can have multiple port channels on a switch, this is the first one. You can see that Gigabit Ethernet 51, I have a spare port that's connecting to suite 113. I only have two cables running between our two suites. So rather than connecting them both to one switch like this and configuring a lag port and introducing a single point of failure where if one switch goes down, I sever the connection between the two suites, I ran the connections like this. Suite 113, suite 110, link, 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 link. There's my lag. That way if any one switch drops in this little rectangle, the whole network survives. But that being said, I have a spare port. Should this interface go down or this switch over here dies, I can just move the cable over and connect it to another switch. The configuration is already in place for that to work. Then right below that, I have the reels port connecting between the two switches. Notice, I've got all the VLANs tagged to ensure we have full connectivity between both suites. Then last but not least, when I scroll down, I see the configuration for the port channel. When you bundle these interfaces into a port channel or a lag interface, there's no real configuration that needs to go under the interface, the physical interface. They gain or inherit all the configuration from the port channel. So this is lag one, and there's all the VLAN tags that I'm adding between them. Now you might be wondering, well, how, how are those interfaces knowing that they belong in a port channel? Well, again, remember, I'm just showing you the commands that I'm issuing right now to do the VLAN config. There's a bunch of configuration on these switches that you're not seeing because there's no sense in typing it a second time. Underneath here is something like channel mode LACP1 to let it know to add it to lag group one and inherit the configuration from port channel one. But you don't see that because that command's already there. All the commands that I have here are just the changes. Every single one of these switches have a similar configuration where I'm adding port descriptions, I'm adding what VLAN tags belong under each one, and it's just the commands that I need to issue. So I can simply go into copy and paste mode when I get to our outage window, which needs to be planned well. That's what we're gonna generate in the next nugget, creating our process flow or the work steps to make sure our late night outage is as short as possible. For that to happen, there has to be some pre-thought put in. We'll do that coming up. For now, we have prepared the copy and paste switch configurations for implementation. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.